Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, if folks uh, can hear me and they're still checking in, please uh, come on in as uh, we begin our uh, program. Uh, only about 10 minutes late, so that's great. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking our wonderful musicians from Eleanor Roosevelt High School. If you can join me in uh, Isabel Bauer on percussion, Azan Chawla on vocals and guitar, Willie Harvey on saxophone, Taylor Lassomsir on guitar, and music director Scott Anderson. And uh, if you will uh, join us and we will uh, bring the flag up. If you can all uh, stand and uh, join us in the uh, national anthem. In Judaism, there is a concept called tikkun olam, meaning in Hebrew, repairing the world. When I first heard this phrase at Rabbi Arthur Schneier's at day school, it spoke to me deeply. I've always had a desire to make people whole, to fix what is broken, and to assist the vulnerable. But Rabbi Schneier has accomplished much greater things than inspiring me to run for office at 12 years old. As the senior rabbi of Parkey Synagogue, he has advanced religious freedom, human rights, and tolerance around the globe. As founder and president of the Appeal of Conscious Foundation and spiritual leader of New York's Parkey Synagogue, he ha was awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal for his service as an international envoy for four administrations and as a Holocaust survivor devoting a lifetime to uncovering forces of hatred and intolerance. He was knighted by Pope Francis as a knight of the Saint Sylvester, one of only three Americans uh, to have this honor. He has received many world leaders at Park East, including two secretaries general of the United Nations. In 2008, he was host to Pope Benedict Sixteenth, the first ever papal visit to a synagogue in the United States, and in 2009, welcomed the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew I, Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Arthur Schneier. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm here to uh, honor one of our uh, star alumnus, uh, 
as you've heard, uh, I remember Ben, when he stood out at uh, the Rabbi Arthur Stein Park East Day School. And uh, I salute you for selecting uh, Sloan Kettering Auditorium for your State of District message. Because anyone who has had any contact with families who had to endure the scourge of cancer know what it means to be compassionate. And Ben, I can speak about your scholarly achievements, your public service, but above all, your compassion. Compassion. In Hebrew, it's kumilat chesed. And that's the kind of leadership our city and our country needs. Compassion, sensitivity, caring. And also, throughout your life in public service, on a daily basis, you want to pay back for the blessings that God has given you. So my star, I congratulate you, and uh, I look forward to sharing many, many more happy occasions in your life, many milestones, and great service to our constituents, the city, state, and the nation. So much for Ben. <laughs> what about us? The new year. And what we may not realize that we're in the midst of a technological revolution. Nothing will be the same again. We're even being challenged by robots and artificial intelligence, which will have an impact on our family life, our social life, and our society. So we're in the midst of a technological revolution. We had an industrial revolution, we had an agricultural revolution, technological revolution. And you know, how many of you um, uh, did you ever have the experience of flying in the plane and the captain says, turbulence, and what do you do? You tighten your seat belts, right? Well, we have to tighten our seat belts. And we need men and women of vision and wisdom to lead and guide us through this turbulent period in the history of civilization. So my prayer for you, and I'm glad to see that uh, so many of your colleagues, including Corey Johnson, who's here, and Carl Maloney, and Liz Kruger, and many of the others, may God grant you the wisdom to guide us a time of turbulence, social turbulence, technological turbulence. We need anchors, people we can depend on, rely on, but above all, practice your compassion. And finally, let us pray that God you placed us on earth, each one of us, to help perfect an imperfect world. And each one of us has the gift and the talent given by the Lord not to be indifferent. We are responsible for one another. 
When there is tragedy, we feel the pain. And just remember 9-11, I remember the pain that, the grief, how we stood together as one. We have to recapture, oh Lord, give us the wisdom to recapture unity and diversity and a commitment on everyone here, oh Lord, that we are going to do everything together with a sense of responsibility for quality of life. A great city, a great state. And let us all say together, God bless America. Let me hear you. And God bless you and your families in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Schneier, for sharing your words and uh, blessing. Uh, it is said that the world stands on uh, three things, Allah Torah, Allah Vodah, Ve'Allah Gmulut Chasadim. Uh, it stands on uh, knowledge, the uh, biblical knowledge, uh, work, and uh, compassion. Next, we have, uh, each year we try to celebrate the arts. You, you just heard some beautiful music. Uh, we try to celebrate the spoken words with a different poem each year. Uh, this year we selected uh, The Character of a Happy Warrior by Williams Wordsworth. Uh, we have uh, a uh, substitution uh, because our, our reader uh, was uh, fallen ill. But the uh, good news is we have other very, we are blessed in this district with strong community leaders. If you could uh, join me in welcoming uh, Judy Schneider, who leads the East 60s Neighborhood Association with her husband, uh, Barry Schneider, and has done so uh, for uh, years in a uh, recitation of uh, the character of a happy warrior. Character of the Happy Warrior, a poem by Williams Wadsworth. Who is the happy warrior? Who is he that every man in arms should wish to be? It is the generous spirit who, when brought among the tasks of real life, hath wrought upon the plan that pleased his boyish thought, whose high endeavors are an inward light that makes the path before him always bright, who with a natural instinct to discern what knowledge can perform is diligent to learn, abides by this resolve, and stops not here, but makes his moral being his prime care. More skillful in self-knowledge, even more pure as tempered more, more able to endure, as more exposed to suffering and distress, thence also more alive to tenderness. Tis he who law is reason, who depends upon that law as on the best of friends, whence in a state where men are tempted still to evil for a God against worst ill, and what is quality or act is best does seldom on a right foundation rest. He labors good on good to fix and owes to virtue every triumph that he knows. Who, if he rise to station of command, rises by open means and there will stand on honorable terms or else retire and in himself possesses his own desire who com comprehends his trust and to the same keeps faithful with the singleness of aim and therefore doth not stoop nor lie in wait for wealth or honors or for the worldly state. And though the heat of conflict keeps the law in calmness made and sees what he foresaw or if an unexpected can succeed, 
Come when it will is equal to the need. Tis finally the man who lifted high conspicuous objection in the nation's eye or left unthought of in, his, in obscurity who with a toward or untoward lot prospers or adverse to his wish or not plays in the many games of life that one where what he must doth value must be won whom neither shape or danger can dismay nor thought or tender happiness betray who not content for former worth stand fast look forward preserving to the last from well to better daily safe surpassed who whether praise of him must walk the earth forever and to noble de deeds give birth or he must fall to sleep without his fame and leave a dead pan and leave a dead unprofitable unprof name finds comfort in him and in his cause and while the mortal mist is gathering draws his breath in confidence of heaven's applause this happier warrior this is he that every man in arms should wish to be I want to thank uh, Judy as uh, a fellow happy warrior, uh, and uh, but for the time that this poem was written about, uh, but uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, now welcome our uh, controller. Uh, one of the most important jobs in the city of New York is keeping an eye on the city's $85 billion budget. The city's controller looks after the city's finances, keeping other elected officials honest. This controller is not just doing that, but doing deep dives into the financials of key policy challenges our city faces. He recently report, released a report on a topic that I have also researched. The New York City controller Scott Stringer last month released new route by route profiles of every bus in the five boroughs. The profiles give New Yorkers route by route information. This includes changes in ridership, average speeds, frequency of buses per hour, number of turns along the route. This will help us to understand why and how New York City finds itself in such a transportation crisis. If you could please join me in welcoming my friend and a person who put me on community board eight way back when, uh, Scott Stringer. So I, I came today because I wanted to see who was crazy enough, <laughs> who were activists enough, who were passionate enough to come to this event in sub-degree weather. Because Ben Kalo said to me, you don't have to come. I'll send you the CD, the PDF. You could watch it through the week. But I had to see for myself. And I'm really glad to be here because this is a great event for people to realize how effective Ben Kalos is as our council member. And I really wanted to come today more than any other year because as Ben finishes his first term, this is also an opportunity for his constituents and the people who work with him to sort of look back and think about the ways that Ben has had an impact. Locally in the district, fighting for pre-K seats for the Upper East Side, making sure that the people in the district get the services they're entitled to, working with the community board on the most local issues. That's what a council member does, and Ben does it very well. And as a former borough president, I can tell you that his passion for his community is something that is very special. But I'm here to tell you what sometimes people don't see, that Ben Kalos believes in something we really have to go back to as a city. He believes in something we don't always talk about. It's called reforming how government works. It's called transparency, right? That is something 
there are sometimes people, when Ben starts talking about these issues or issues a report or finds himself in an article in the New York Times pushing these issues, I know the powerful players sometimes roll their eyes and say, well, that's just Kalos. Well, folks, it's not just Kalos. All of us who do this work believe that given technology, given the opportunity for us to dig deeper into government, the way we should approach our city is through the lens of what everybody should know and how everybody participates. The backroom deals, the way the game is played in the backroom is not the way our city government should run. So I want to thank you, Ben, for being one of those few elected officials who painfully takes the time to think about the way in which government can play a positive role, an open role, where elected officials are not afraid to disclose and to participate fully. You have become one of those leaders in the city that has championed those causes. So I just wanted to come by and wish you the best of luck, new success with this new city council. By the way, you may have a surprise visit, but I want to also say that Corey Johnson as the new city council speaker means more transparency and more opportunity for government, and I know you're going to work very well with him. I will see all of you soon. My office hours are open. Anytime you want to see me when it's above 40 degrees, call me. Uh, I, 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 will, I will be here. You know, I'm not getting any younger. This is easy. Uh, the kids love the snow, um, but I like coming in and coming out. But no, all kidding aside, have a great New Year's. Ben, congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Comptroller Stringer. We are so very lucky to have you watching over our city's finances. And as uh, the original reformer in Albany, uh, glad to have a partner in reform uh, here in the city. It's a particular pleasure to introduce my next guest. I've known him for the past 10 years. We fought together in progressive campaigns uh, for folks like Mark Green. For the past four years, we've been colleagues in the city council, working together to advance progressive policies from improving health care for all New Yorkers and protecting landmarks that give our neighborhoods their character. If you could uh, please join me in uh, welcoming our new New York City Council speaker, Corey Johnson. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And I want to thank uh, Ben for having me at his uh, State of the District. I thought I was coming to an inauguration, uh, but it's, it's sort of the same thing. It's, as the rabbi would say, it's Ben's bar mitzvah for 2018. Uh, I, I just wanted to come by and really um, thank Ben, because over the last four years, uh, Ben and I have been able to do great work together. And hopefully, you all know this as his constituents, but Ben does a fantastic job here in the district with his uh, meeting folks on the corner and Ben in your building and all of the local work that he does. But down at City Hall, he's one of the most prolific legislators in the entire city council. I believe that over the last four years, Ben has passed almost 30 pieces of legislation around that number and he's tackled issues that other folks for years have shied away from, whether it's taking on the Board of Standards and Appeals or being chair of the Government Operations Committee and looking at agencies that folks do not think of as super important or the sexiest issues, but they're issues that actually affect the day-to-day -day lives of New Yorkers and the day-to-day -day lives of his constituents. Ben is known down at City Hall as being and this is a good thing, independent. He is an independent guy who has strongly held beliefs, and they are progressive beliefs, they are principled beliefs, but he also, at every hearing, whether it be a budget hearing or an individual committee hearing, he is asking smart, incisive questions that affect his district, this district. I can't tell you the number of times where he's banging the table asking for more pre-K seats here for this district. Or he's banging the table talking about Vision Zero and ensuring that uh, folks are protected when the mayor is rolling out plans for the entire city. 
or he's banging the table talking about uh, irresponsible overdevelopment of the communities that he represents. So he is vice chair of the Progressive Caucus. He is someone that is, anyone will tell you, I'm sure you all know this, he is an extremely hard worker. He doesn't stop working. He does that locally, he does it down at City Hall, and I am really grateful to call him a friend and a colleague. Ben and I are around the same age. We've been involved in politics and in community organizing uh, since our early 20s, and it's so lovely to be able to serve with someone who came up in the same way that I did and who stays close to his principles, beliefs, and his constituents. So I wanted to come by today to offer my full support of him over the next four years and my support of this wonderful district and of his constituents. So uh, there are other great elected officials that are here today as well who I also want to thank. I want to thank my dear friend, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, who is just a rock star down in Washington. Thank you, Carolyn. I want to thank our controller, Controller Scott Stringer, our former Manhattan Borough President, my dear, dear friend. I worked on her campaign for the Assembly, uh, volunteering up here in these neighborhoods, Assemblywoman Rebecca Seawright, <laughs> State Senator Liz Kruger. Does anyone know who Liz Kruger is? Everyone knows Liz. Uh, the the uh, hardest working, not woman, person in government and show business, our incredible borough president, Gail Brewer. And I'm sure there are other folks who I am forgetting, not purposefully, but today is about Ben, today is about this incredible district, and I stand ready, willing, and excited to support him to continue to effectuate change for his constituents and for the city of New York. I look forward to getting to know all of you. I look forward to working together. And I look, for, I look forward in 2018 for doing the most good for the people who need it most. Thank you very much. Congressmember Carol Maloney is joining us this afternoon at the same time as she's fighting for us in Washington, D.C. during these very important time. Congressmember Maloney is a fierce advocate for her home district here on the east side. Uh, she's the co-chair of the East River Esplanade uh, Task Force, and you'll hear a lot more about that later. She is America's Congress member. She's been the one leading the charge to protect our health care, uh, and uh, she will continue to lead us uh, as we, we face troubling times in uh, Washington. If you can join me in welcoming Congressmember Carol Maloney. Thank you so much, Ben, and, and thank you so much, Corey. I can't tell you how important it is that the new speaker is from Manhattan. Uh, he's going to be a voice for all of our five boroughs, but the fact that he's from our home borough, he understands our needs, our problems, that's a great win for all of us. And it's a great win when we re-elected uh, Ben Kalos to the city council. And I got to tell you, it's the coldest I've ever been. So I have great respect for any, all of you got out here. You are, you are the warm-hearted, the hard-hearted, and, and the devoted uh, constituents on, on the east side. And we couldn't have a better person working for us or advocating for us than Ben Kalos. I've, I've been proud to be a partner with him in his first four years and look forward to the next four years with him. Uh, we, we co-chair the East Side Esplanade together, and one of the great attributes of our city is the waterfront, and it has been underutilized and underbeautified. And uh, actually, Lappin and I started this task force. I asked Ben to join us, and I am uh, really uh, impressed with his devotion, his intelligence, his creativity, and really uh, his uh, perseverance in making things happen from the private sector. He's, he's secured funding from Rockefeller, Gracie Mansion, uh, all other types of businesses that are expanding have contributed money, and we will soon have a green chain all the way down the east side, giving more access uh, to our people, increasing our quality of life and our enjoyment in our neighborhood. Thank you, Ben. And, and we have to thank him, too, 
for the new 400 new slots we got uh, for kindergarten. Uh, we were underrepresented, we had more voices, and uh, I can't tell you how helpless I would feel as a Congress member when uh, friends and neighbors and constituents would say, I've got, I've, I've got a pre-K kid and, and there's no slot for us, and they want us to send us to Staten Island or something crazy, which you can't do. So we got 400 additional slots for our neighborhood. Thank you, Ben Kalos. And I, I can tell you he's been a wonderful partner. In fact, we're doing a town hall meeting this next Saturday. It's going to be at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, and it's on the tax plan, the impact on health care, uh, the impact on the deductibility of state and city taxes, the creative ideas that we're trying to come up with to confront that. Uh, that's just another example of our partnership. But I always know how good a local person is, representative is, uh, because I used to be a city council member. And I, 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 so I'm very close to the community. So if something's not happening in the city, I start getting phone calls. But the only phone calls I get on Ben Kalos are people saying he's doing a great job, he's a great city council member, we, we appreciate his work so much. Uh, we do are, are fortunate to have a strong team. Thank you. Here uh, with uh, our, our borough president, uh, our state senator, our assemblywoman, we all work together. And when you work together, you're able to do things like build the Second Avenue subway. <coughs> How many of you have written on it? How many? <coughs> if you haven't been on it, you've got to write on it. The artwork in it is worth it just to go to see the artwork. It is a state of art. It is the best subway in the entire United States. It's rated number one. On day one, it moved over 300,000 people. And when I went to Congress, it was one of my top goals. And I, I've got about five other projects, but they're not going to happen unless the team works together on the city, state, and federal level to make it happen. Uh, we are going to build the Second Avenue subway up to 125th Street and down to the tip of Manhattan. Already the businesses are telling me their businesses have gone up 30%. It is the newest subway in the country of its size in 60 years. And uh, it was planned for 100 years. We finally made it happen with the team here on the east side. And I get reports every day on how it makes your life easier. In addition, we have over $4 billion coming in for what's called the East Side Connector that brings in the LIRR, and part of it is a whole redevelopment of Grand Central. We have $690 million coming in connecting the Queens and Brooklyn area of my district in the Kosciusko Bridge. It was the worst bridge in the whole state. It's now going to be the most state-of-art, up-to-date one in the world. And we just got $300 million as a down payment on high-speed rail between New York and Boston, straightening out the tracks in uh, Interlocker in, 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 uh, in Queens. Can you imagine how that would grow our economy? If, if the Second Avenue subway increased business 30%, can you imagine cutting an hour or two hours off between New York these, and, and, and Boston, the amount of economic growth would, would happen there. It's truly, truly uh, an inspiring project and one we're going to get finished. But in, and the L train connecting Manhattan and Brooklyn, we just got a billion dollars to renovate that, modernize it, bring it into the 21st century. So I have over $10 billion uh, slated to go into our district in the next uh, couple of years for infrastructure projects, and it wouldn't happen without the help of Ben Kalos and Rebecca Seawright and Liz Kruger and our borough president and all of you. So what can I say? 2018 is going to be a great year. Uh, let me tell you, I love coming home and, and, and being in the sanity of uh, a caring New York. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like a reality show that you can't believe in Washington. Uh, the only thing I can say is that it's not boring. Let me tell you, every day you go to work, you say, what is going to happen today? And believe me, whatever was planned has been changed, and it's something new. So it's, uh, we've got our hands full, and that means we're going to have to work harder. I'm very, very concerned about the future of health care. Uh, we are a health care center for the world here in New York, and our hospitals are our number two employer in our great city. Our number three is becoming high-tech. We've become the high-tech center 
uh, for the East Coast, and a lot of that is because of Roosevelt Island, another project that uh, Ben has shown incredible leadership along with Rebecca and Liz and many, many other people, all of you. In any event, I'm thrilled to be here to see you, to wish you Happy New Year, and to work with Ben. And uh, I always ask him, what's next, Ben? What's next? I, I told him I saw, I, I saw Obama the other day. He's moving in the neighborhood. Did you know that? He's purchased a home in the neighborhood. And he said he, he said he loved the Esplanade. And he said, next time you see Ben Kalos, ask him what's next. So, so, so maybe we'll hear from Ben Kalos what's next for our great neighborhood. Uh, I, I think that every member of Congress feels that they represent the greatest neighborhood in the whole world. But in my case, I think it's really true. Some of the brightest, most caring people, thank you for the honor to serve you and to be here applauding Ben with you. Thank you, Ben, for all you do. Being an elected official, uh, some, there's folks who are elected officials that you might just grab a beer with and maybe they can pronounce the word nuclear or not. Uh, others redefine it and uh, they do so by uh, being in multiple places at once. Uh, and it might be their superpower, uh, but now it's a, a part of the job. And uh, it's our, our Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, is oftentimes at four, six, seven, eight events every single night. Uh, she's working nonstop on trying to save supermarkets, uh, small business zoning, which she brought to the west side. Uh, she was our partner in rezoning uh, the Sutton area, and uh, I don't think we could hope for a, a better borough president. If you can please join me in welcoming uh, Gail Brewer. So happy new year, it is an honor to be here. I do want to share the accolades that Carolyn and Scott and others have brought to Ben. Um, we have a lot of special relationships. I was on the council for 12 years and part of those years I was chair of government operations. And now Ben is, and he does a much better job than I did. But the best part too is before that I was chair of technology and he knows a lot more about technology than I do but we share that fascination and love for civic hacking. I think we both prefer going to a hackathon than to a movie. That's not true, but it's close. <laughs> and we also love to think of ways that technology and government operations can work together to improve government. And this is very wonky, but very, very uh, special to both of us and a real sharing opportunity. Um, I think all the things you've heard are true because you know that as constituents, but. On the legislative front, he did something really special. When I was in the council, I wanted to get young people to be able to vote, 16 and 17 year olds in city elections. I know some people, adults, think that's a really bad idea. Well, I didn't get much support. And so we ended up with city uh, legislation passing that Ben helped sponsor to put 16 and 17 year olds on community boards. And I have to say, particularly in this area, they have been fantastic. We put them on. And Ben was the author of that legislation in the council and many, many other pieces of legislation. I think some of you in board six, is anybody here from the board six area? Yes, there's a mother. And there is a mother of a member of that particular committee who's gone on and done great things. Um, on constituent service, he even has condoms in the office. I copy that. I don't copy everything, but condoms in the office, oh my God. They're in a little, they're in a bowl. And it's because he knows this is a 24-hour office, and whatever we can do to be helpful, we will be helpful. <laughs> he has worked with us on the senior food program where for $8, Roosevelt Island, and on the east side working with the senior centers, we have a food program working with Grow NYC so that seniors can get inexpensive, high quality, actually $8 for the bag, $20 value. And it is so successful. Again, much thanks to all the elected officials on the east side, but particularly Ben. Working with him on East Harlem, because he has a portion of that, that too was a rezoning. And working with him on the Homeless Task Force, Carolyn mentioned the waterfront. 
and all the land use issues. I think everyone in this neighborhood knows there's nothing more challenging than zoning, land use, finding affordable housing, contextual zoning, how do we build affordable housing? And I come from the west side, the east side is similar, without building to the moon and the sky, without an absolutely huge building. And all the developers, with all due respect for anybody in the room, who want to do that, it's just not right for residential areas, in my opinion. But boy, is it a fight. Boy, is it a fight. And working with Ben is such an honor and a pleasure. We met just this past week, um, meeting that he pulled together, trying to figure out how we can look at ways that um, contextual zoning can exist on the east side. He's always the first in the group to come up with ways that we can solve problems. And you are very, very fortunate in that situation. He worked hard with Rockefeller to make sure that they, as they built out their university, contributed to the Esplanade. He talked about Sutton. It wouldn't have happened. All of those fights tower on the base or whatever we end up with without his leadership. East 88th Street. The list goes on and on. There's no project, no uh, piece of land that he's not fighting for you and for all of us regarding his constituents. He also, he doesn't have a lot of schools. I know when I was on the west side, I had like, I don't know, like 30 schools or something. He doesn't have a lot. Every single one gets tender, loving care. Whether it's a fight for the pre-K, as you know, or fighting for funding where we can partner and try to get what those schools needed. Those principals love him. They know that he's there for them. And it's a real pleasure to work with him. I also want to just say, I go everywhere. I work hard. So does he. And the issue is, for instance, if you are working uh, attendance at the borough board, even just came to my small swearing in, which we had recently in my office. There he was, Ben Kalos. It was such an honor to have him participating. Um, technology is where we share the most uh, interest. Um, I have, there's a funny story. When I was elected to the council, there were a couple of races for speaker, if you remember. That was Quinn versus de Blasio. I supported de Blasio. He lost. So I got the technology committee, which was supposed to be a bad committee. He's supposed to get you know, health or housing or something like that. So I took that committee and I think made lemonade out of lemons in terms of bringing the uh, open data, the bill that passed. It's probably uh, nationally known in New York where we can actually get all the agencies by this year in July. Every single one of the 80 agencies in New York has to put all their data on this portal. And it helps. We've now been able to get the community boards to use it. We're working on board stat where we're taking the 311 data and breaking it into graphs and info so that the public can understand what is going on in my block and my neighborhood in terms of every aspect of city government. So this is a person who can do this in his sleep. I try to do it while, while I'm awake. But he can do it when he's asleep and awake. And it's a very, very pl great pleasure to work with him on something that we care so much about. He's also a believer in transparency. You know, some of our elected officials, they want to be transparent, but, or they want to be transparent until. Um, but this amazing elected official believes in it in the real, most basic sense that whether it's campaign finance or whether it is FOIL or whether it's another uh, opportunity to open up government, he sees how it can be done and he pushes for it. And others are like hemming and hawing, and he's pushing in the right way. So it's another example of his amazing leadership. So just like everyone else, I'm honored to be here, whether we're working together on our district office, because we too have, as the borough president, we're the first one to have a district office on 125th Street, whether it's technology, whether it's food for the seniors, or all those really tough land use issues. Uh, ben Kalos is an amazing, hardworking partner. So I say Happy New Year to all of you. You are very, very fortunate. I am fortunate to work with him. And I just want to be here like everyone else to congratulate Ben Kalos. Thank you very, very much. Thank you uh, our, to our borough president, uh, Gail Brewer, who I'm sure will be in six other places as we speak. Uh, speaking of transparency, I should tell you about the time we helped constituent fo foil my office. So we, in essence, actually foiled ourselves. Uh, so uh, no one is actually more transparent than Gail Brewer. Uh, and so our next partner in government is Assemblymember Rebecca Seawright and her staff who we work closely with in our office. She's our representative in Albany. 
And the assembly, her legislation has helped divorced parents save time and money, expanded health care screenings for women. She's a hard worker, and I'm happy to have her on my team. Uh, please join me in welcoming assembly member Rebecca Seawright. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to represent you in Albany. And let's give another big round of applause to, we're so fortunate to have as our councilman, Ben Kalos. And I thank you, Ben, for the great partnership that, that you and I have and our offices here on the Upper East Side and also on Roosevelt Island. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our fabulous Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, who really is everywhere. And America's Congresswoman, somebody that we work very closely with, Carolyn Maloney, thank you. Our state senator, Liz Kruger, who I swim with every day when we're in Albany. We stay at the same hotel and we swim every morning. And I'm so fortunate to have Liz Kruger represent me in the state senate. And I know that, that you feel the same way. Um, it's going to be a very interesting session. We gaveled in last week. I'll be going to Albany later today. Um, and we have session tomorrow. Speaker Hasty recently appointed me to uh, the very important codes committee. So any legislation that changes the civil or criminal code has to pass through the codes committee. This was a committee that I'd been fighting to be appointed to along with the education committee. Um, I've pre-introduced some financial literacy legislation as chair of the subcommittee on consumer fraud protection. And just recently, at the end of December, the governor signed my 3D mammogram legislation into law. A constituent came to me, a constituent recently came and said, Rebecca, I can't get the insurance company to pay for the 3D mammogram that my doctor has prescribed. So we introduced some legislation, got it passed, and thanks to the governor who signed it recently, it will become effective January 26. And Lastly, I want to invite all of you to stop by our new district community office. We're on York Avenue between 78th and 79th Street. Uh, we have a free housing clinic, and we'd love for you to stop in. Thank you. Over the last four years, it's been a pleasure to be able to learn from and work with your state senator, Liz Kruger. Senator Kruger is working in Albany to represent the interests of all the residents of District 5. One of the causes she's pushing that I find truly commendable is her effort to take on counterproductive state fossil fuel subsidies. Her efforts are shining a light on and could halt these tax breaks, credits, and refunds for the use of dirty fossil fuels. She's also the leader in reform. She uh, actually uh, went one step further than any other elected official in terms of trying to clean up corruption in Albany by actually getting political uh, to do so and uh, starting the No Bad Apples pack where she's actually gone after corrupt senators and removed them from office. Uh, she's somebody that is on my speed dial and as we deal with so very many issues in the district, uh, she is our, our partner in uh, making trouble and doing our best to represent you. If you can join me in welcoming uh, my friend and colleague, State Senator Liz Kruger. Good afternoon, everyone. We've had so many wonderful speakers. I'm not gonna take very much time. I wanted to thank Ben for giving me the honor of swearing him in today for his second term. Yeah. And for those, I think hopefully all of you do know Ben Kalos now after his first four year term as a city council member. Um, and as one of the electeds who gets to work with him day in, day out, there are many wonderful things you can say about Ben. One is he never runs out of good new ideas. Just endless stream of new good ideas and thoughts about how to make government work better, how to address concerns of his community and of the city of New York. And as an elected official who goes to Albany and is now starting my 16th year, which is a little scary, um, I can tell you that there are not enough of us working in government 
who actually can see the big picture, sort through the issues, and come up with new ways to approach them. So it doesn't mean that every idea Ben has is going to be successful. It doesn't even mean that every idea Ben has is one you might agree with. I think what is wonderful is Ben is an honest, principled, incredibly intelligent person who has chosen public service because of his belief in it and wakes up every day with an, a list of all the things he's already <coughs> trying to get done and a new list to add on to that of things to improve our lives. So for people who might not even ever see a proposal get implemented and realize that it started with Ben Kalos, there's a good chance it started with Ben Kalos at some point in time. So I am delighted that I will have um, more opportunities to work with him um, over the next four years. And then who knows, he's such a young man. So I'm gonna ask Ben to come up. This is where the camera is. Okay. Oh, Carolyn. Okay. I, oh, thank you. Joined by Carolyn Maloney and Gail Brewer. I, state your name. I, Ben Kalos. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Do you solemnly swear or affirm? That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of New York. The Constitution of the State of New York. The Charter of the City of New York. The Charter of the City of New York. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office of council member for the fifth council district. That I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of council member for the fifth council district. In the borough of Manhattan. In the borough of Manhattan. The city of New York. In the city of New York. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you. Bravo. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. See a number of folks in the back who are standing. Please uh, grab a seat. Uh, this is actually the time where we're, that we're usually uh, finishing up our state of the district. Uh, we've been lucky to have a lot of our elected officials uh, join us here today. Good afternoon. Councilmember Ben Kalos, I've had the honor and privilege of representing the Upper East Side, Sutton, East Harlem, and Roosevelt Island in the City Council for four years, six days, 13, 14 hours, three minutes, and uh, 14 seconds. Uh, I love this job, and every moment is a precious opportunity to make the world a better place, and as many of you know, since I first got elected, I've been counting the time to squeeze in every moment. I want to thank Rabbi Arthur Steyer for today's invocation and for an education grounded in Jewish values that I carry with me today in my mission of tikkun olam, repairing the world. Our wonderful musicians from Eleanor Roosevelt High School, Isabella Bauer on percussion, Azan Chawla on vocals and guitar, Willie Harvey on saxophone, Taylor Lassam Sira on guitar, and music director Scott Anderson. Judy Schneider, my fellow happy warrior for her beautiful reading and for her lifetime of fighting for the East 60s Neighborhood Association. Our Congress member, Carol Maloney, our controller, Scott Stringer, our speaker, Corey Johnson, our Senator, Liz Kruger, Assembly member, Rebecca Seawright. I want to thank Phoebe Kemick, uh, Shakima Grant, Ed Swisher, and the whole team here at Mount uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering for opening up this wonderful space for us to gather and stay warm today. Most of all, thank you to all of you, the residents who have joined us here this afternoon for our annual report to you, and to hear about the battles we've fought, the ones we've won, those we've lost, as you look towards the future and what we can accomplish together to improve our neighborhood and our city. And if you're just here for bagels with Ben and a free tote bag, that's fine too. <laughs> Today we'll discuss 
our open office, how we can help you, the funding we provide and policies we pass to invest in education, improve commutes, rebuild our parks, improve quality of life, fight overdevelopment, find affordable housing, and reform our government to better serve you. Over the last four years, six days, 14 hours, five minutes and 34 seconds, I've pursued a goal of opening our government to you and my hope to meet all 168,413 people that I represent. I meet residents each month for First Friday from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Uh, generally, I get to spend each month that Friday with Elsbeth Ryman, uh, who once worked with Assemblymember Pete Granis, and uh, she is one of the best parts of my job. Uh, brainstorm with Ben at 6 p.m. on the second Tuesday. Uh, my office has mobile hours at senior centers on Roosevelt Island and NYCHA, and I even make house calls for Ben in your building where I can join you for your annual meeting. I also do weddings and bar mitzvahs. <laughs> In the evenings, we hold monthly events, and my staff and I are attend community board, precinct council, neighborhood association, and tent association meetings. In the warmer months, you can find us at street fairs or cooking with Kalos at green markets. And don't forget, a fan favorite, our fresh food box with farm-to-table produce for just $14. We are here to help. We have free legal clinics in our district office on housing, family law, domestic violence, and even life planning. My constituent service team, led by the amazing Debbie Lightbody with support from Tirso Tavares and a dozen graduate students in social work, as well as many of our undergraduate interns, have helped more than 7,500 constituents to stay in their homes, review their SNAP benefits, or follow up on complaints made to 3 one in an effort to improve the city. If you have a problem, give us a call. We're here to help. Constituent service is about addressing individual problems, but it's also about making the system work for everybody. More seniors in my district aren't getting the hunger assistance that they are entitled to than anywhere else in the city. With so many government benefits, it's hard to learn about all of them, let alone find out if you qualify, and it's even harder to apply. That's why I authored automatic benefits legislation that would use information the government already has to provide the benefits residents need automatically. After authoring memorandums, clearing the legal regulatory framework, releasing the software to provide the benefits in partnership with Intuit, and securing funding to study the long-term impacts, the city has agreed to study this important step from a reactive to a proactive government. I want to thank the voters who came out last year in the primary and general elections, where we won with 7,847 votes at 75% and 22,514 votes at 81% respectively. Uh, it is a little short of the 99.9% .9 that I was hoping for, but uh, <laughs> it's good enough. Uh, but voting can and should be easier, which is why I worked with New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman to author and pass online voter registration for New York City so you can register on your phone, snapping a picture of your signature, or just signing with your finger. We can use technology and other... We can use technology in other places to make our democracy even better. You as a resident should know how every penny of your tax dollars is being spent. Our city's massive $85 billion budget should be transparent. That's why I authored, negotiated, and passed the open budget bill. While the budget may currently be available in paper or in massive PDFs, you can now search the budget online, download it, and look through it to see how we spend your hard-earned tax dollars. Transparency is one thing, but government should really work for you, and you should have a say in how your tax dollars are spent in your district. Through participatory budgeting, residents 14 and older have been voting on how to spend discretionary capital dollars from my office every year. I hope you'll consider becoming a delegate to help choose what goes on the ballot. So far, the community has voted on where to spend over $3 million in the district on green roofs, new computers, smart boards, science labs for schools. I've matched your dollars with $2 million in investment in science, technology, engineering, math in our schools. As a graduate of the Bronx High School of Science, I believe every child is entitled to a world-class education. Every year, we partner with world-renowned Auction House Sotheby's to bring hundreds of pieces of art to nearly a dozen public schools in the district for our annual art show. Thank you to PS183's parent, Patricia Corrigi, Principal Tara Napoleone, art teacher Juan Ling Farr, for organizing the event and for the hundreds of talented children whose art we hang at Sotheby's each year. We've also brought Brainstorm with Ben to the classroom. After kindergarten students at PS290 learned about pesticides from their teacher, Paula Ragavan, 
We proposed legislation to ban them from parks long before the World Health Organization found Roundup to be a carcinogen, despite having the <laughs> cutest hearing ever. With strong testimony from medical experts, we will continue to fight next year. And as the nation slipped into controversy over transgender bathrooms, students at Eastside Middle School, led by a fearless principal and David Goetz, authored legislation to require the Department of Education to offer LGBTQ training to teachers, share who received the training, and which schools have gender sexuality alliances in order to support their expansion. Students Neil Sarkar, Katerina Kaur, Chloe Shasimo, and Ananya Roy testified before the council and have helped pass this into law. Yes, it's true. If you haven't attended a brainstorm with Ben, proposed an idea, drafted legislation, pass it into law by middle school, then you're an underachiever in this district. <laughs> we do not have enough school seats on the Upper East Side. This was true before I got elected and is only getting worse with all the new construction. With child care starting at $24,000 in the neighborhood, many parents are forced to choose between a career and leaving the city they love. That's why I've been fighting for pre-K for three and four-year-olds since 2013. But when we fought alongside Mayor de Blasio and won funding from Albany, we only got 154 seats for 2,767 four-year-olds. We more than doubled seats in 2015 to 377. In 2016, we worked with Roosevelt Island Parents Network, Day Nursery, and Operating Corporation to open 90 pre-K seats to fully meet the need on the island and nearly doubled seats again to 618. When we actually lost seats in 2017 with 736 four-year-olds applying for only 550 seats, we organized a rally with the support of our Congress member, Carol Maloney, Comptroller Stringer, Public Advocate James, Borough President <coughs> Brewer, State Senator Kruger, Assembly Member Seawright and Court, and Council Member Gorodnik. As you may have heard, on Friday in the Wall Street Journal, we just won an additional 400 seats, with 234 seats opening in the fall at 57th and East 95th Street, and 180 next year on East 76th Street. I'm sure that need will quickly outpace demand, especially as we expand pre-kindergarten to three-year-olds as part of 3K for All. With child care on the horizon for three and four-year-olds, I hope to continue to expand the program with federal and state funds to two-year-olds, one-year-olds, and eventually infants for a vision of universal child care. But that will take a lot of work, so please join me in making sure that every new construction site or empty storefront with more than 10,000 square feet is considered for pre-kindergarten. If you need a seat for your child or when you see a space, please email upk at bencalos.com and we'll be sure to work with you. We also need more seats for gifted and talented students in School District 2, which includes the Upper East Side, where 306 preschoolers, nearly half of those who applied, were turned away in 2016. That's why I introduced past legislation that will track applications, offers, and admissions geographically. This will help assess need by neighborhood and give us a better understanding of how geogra geography contributes to school segregation, which in New York City has only gotten worse since Brown versus the Board of Education and must finally come to an end. As we identify need and build more seats, we must ensure children have the support they need to learn. I grew up in this neighborhood in a household with a single parent and my grandparents. That meant I was twice exceptional and eligible for free and reduced school lunch. But I never actually ate the lunch because of the stigma surrounding it. In order to ensure no child makes the same bad choice I did, I fought for and won breakfast after the bell and universal free lunch to provide two free meals a day for all 1.1 of New York City's public school children. And And Local Law 215 of 2017, which I authored, will require the city to set goals and report on increasing participation in these programs. With children out of school at 3 p.m., the workday ending at 5 p.m., if you're lucky, uh, and most parents not getting home till much later, children need after-hours programs and young adults may want jobs which will keep them out of trouble. These programs can be coupled with supper to send children home well-fed with their homework done to spend quality time with their family. I believe that we can meet Maslow's hierarchy of needs for our children by helping them to self-actualize with food they need through universal supper, 
the love and support they need from adults through universal after school and youth jobs, and the education they need to have better lives. But education doesn't stop in schools and continues in the home where if you can't access a computer with broadband internet, you're facing what is becoming the homework gap. One in four homes in Brooklyn does not have broadband, and in the Bronx, nearly one in three homes lacks this essential utility. When Charter sought to purchase Time Warner Cable, we worked with public advocate Tish James and other elected officials to condition the sale on providing affordable high-speed internet to low-income residents. We won Spectrum Internet Assist, which provides 30 megabits for only $14.99 per month for households with students receiving free or reduced school lunch and seniors on supplemental Social Security income. This has the power to bring affordable, high-speed internet to more than 1.2 million low-income New Yorkers. As children grow up, higher education is only getting more expensive. I'm one of many who will be paying off their student loans until I am close to retirement. That is why in 2013 I proposed and the New York Times endorsed for giving loans for education at City University of New York for students who stay, work and pay taxes in the city and state, repaying our investment in their education several fold in income taxes. I'm proud to say that Governor Cuomo made it happen statewide without any debt but as an Excelsior scholarship so that students can attend CUNY or my alma mater, SUNY. This is an effective investment in our most important asset, our residents. I hope to expand this program further. All high school students aged 16 and older, particularly those at risk or less engaged in academic pursuits, should receive a stipend for GED preparation and exams as well as completing a free two-year career or technical degree from CUNY's community colleges. Those who might otherwise drop out of school could come into adulthood ready to start a career. For careers in technology, we need higher education institutions of the future, which we've built right here on Roosevelt Island at the recently opened Cornell New York City Tech. We just cut the ribbon on the Tata Innovation Center to connect students, researchers, and companies to build the next big app. Look out, look out Silicon Valley, even Silicon Alley, because we've got Silicon Island. <laughs> Getting to Roosevelt Island, as well as the transportation desert that was the Upper East Side, had to be improved. After all, transportation is the economic lifeblood of our city. We finally authorized the decades delayed franchise for the Roosevelt Island Tram for the next 50 years through 2068. We launched ferry service on Roosevelt Island in the summer and expect it will come to the Upper East Side at 90th Street this summer. We spent four years every two weeks with our Congress member Carolyn Maloney making sure that the Second Avenue subway stayed on track for completion and we joined our Governor Cuomo in opening the Second Avenue subway this time last year for New Year's Eve bringing the queue to the Upper East Side for hundreds of thousands of riders a day. We even brought free Wi-Fi to our subways. On the Upper East Side, we love our buses and have been focused on something even Westsiders can agree with us on, which is improving crosstown service. After, <laughs> after implementing select bus service for off-board payments on the M86, we want an expansion to 79th Street, which opened last summer, and we continue to push for 96th Street. After you voted for bus countdown clocks and participatory budgeting in 2014, we invested $640,000 in 32 bus countdown clocks for the M15, 31, 57, 66, and M72, so you know when the next bus is coming. However, despite the investments in SBS, we've, proposed, we've seen proposed cuts to other crosstown service, the M31, M57, M66, and M72. Uh, though we've been able to, again, work with all the elected officials you heard from today, our Congress member Carol Maloney, Assembly member Rebecca Seawright, Senator uh, Liz Kruger, and our borough president Gail Brewer, uh, to author a letter to the MTA, we were able to save the M57, uh, but we continue to fight for the M31 and M72. We've partnered with the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association, led by Valerie Mason and Liz Patrick, on a petition to save our bus service. If you haven't already, Please sign and share the petition at benkalos.com.
We're working with Mayor de Blasio to test restricting loading and unloading times from rush hour, as well as restricting double parking to only one side of the street in the East 50s, which if successfully hope to bring to the Upper East Side. In order to improve commutes for pedestrians, bicycles, and vehicles, they all must have a safe space on the street. We added two crosstown bike lane pairs and opened the Second Avenue protected bike lane. With an increase in cyclists, we focused our efforts in a bike safety program that uses education, equipment, and enforcement and has become a model for the city. We offer every restaurant on the Upper East Side free vests, lights, bells, and even helmets in exchange for participating in a 90-minute training in English, Spanish, and Chinese. City Bike offers a free class monthly in my district office on the rules of the road, giving participants a free pass or month on their membership. We've even given away 6,000 helmets. And perhaps most importantly, the NYPD has increased enforcement, writing 1,557 summonses in 2017 and confiscating 103 illegal e-bikes, representing a disproportionately high 10% of all enforcement in the city of New York. We've worked with the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association to distribute flyers to buildings and great restaurants on their use of safety equipment and bikes. If you are interested, please join us in expanding this effort. And if you see or experience a dangerous intersection where you've had a close call, please report it to my office so we can make our streets safer for you and everyone else. You can visit bencalo slash livable dash streets. Traffic safety also means anticipating new dangers such as new garbage trucks that will be driving through our neighborhood when the marine transfer station opens. Though we've fought the dump for years, exposing high costs, building citywide coalitions, and introducing legislation to protect air quality and mandating zero waste, uh, and I will note that our assembly member, Rebecca Seawright, has passed legislation in Albany for uh, air quality. Uh, yes. <laughs> Mayor de Blasio continues to squander hundreds of millions of dollars in building this monstrosity. We moved the ramp to protect 35,000 children at Asphalt Green and most notably forced Department of Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia to agree under oath to give up two-thirds of the 5,200 tons per day capacity, keeping more than 300 garbage trucks off our streets each day. But we still haven't given up. We're tapping into our strongest assets, our residents, like you, and Evan Z. Booker, whose proposal I support to repurpose the Marine Transfer Station. Please join the fight at bencalos.com slash MTS. If you've taken a walk anywhere near the Marine Transfer Station, one thing you've noticed is that the East River Esplanade was literally falling into the river. That's why I joined our Congress member, Carol Maloney, as co-chair of the East River Esplanade Task Force. In four short years, we've secured and overseen spending of $190 million in public and private dollars. So let's go through it from top to bottom. Last year, we allocated $1 million to fund irrigation from 96th to 90th Street. Last summer, we opened 90th Street Pier to the public as park space in partnership with DOT, Parks, and Friends of the East River Esplanade, led by Jennifer Ratner. We broke ground this summer on $35 million secured in 2014 to build, rebuild from 88th to 90th Street and points north. In 2016, I allocated $500,000 to repair John Finley Walk from 81st to 84th Streets following recommendations from Civitas. We cut the ribbon in December on a new $15 million accessible 81st Street pedestrian bridge to 78th Street connecting the upper and lower esplanades. We broke ground in October on a $1 million public-private partnership with Hospital for Special Surgery to rebuild 70th to 72nd Street and maintain it in perpetuity, which will soon expand to 78th Street as part of one master plan. This is something secured as a community benefit for upcoming expansions. In 2016, I allocated a $1 million to renovate 70th to 68th Street to seamlessly connect our two public-private partnerships for one look and feel. In 2014, we secured, and in 2016, we broke ground on a $10 million public-private partnership with Rockefeller University that I obtained as a community benefit for their expansion to rebuild the seawall and parkland above it from 62nd to 68th. Contracting is moving forward on $29 million in public-private funding secured as a community benefit from Memorial Stone Kettering to build Andrew Housewell Green Phase 2B from 61st to 60th. In November, we cut the ribbon on a newly planted Andrew Haswell Green Phase 2A under the Alice Acock Sculpture at 60th Street. 
and in 2017, we unveiled the design for an extension of the East River Esplanade from 61st to 53rd Street with Mayor de Blasio, who announced $100 million in funding in 2016 with completion slated for 22, 2022. Yes, that's two miles of new and improved East River Esplanade funded in construction or opened in only four years. And uh, just as a preview, uh, as our Congress member, Carol Maloney, noted what's next, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's even more coming. Uh, we have our work cut out for us. We continue to work alongside neighbors like Charlie Whitman, Harvey Katz, and Ira Shapiro on the 81st Street Bridge, uh, as well as community groups and fellow electeds, uh, Congress Member Maloney, Assembly Member Seawright, uh, and Senator Liz Kruger, to pay attention to projects like the 81st Street Pedestrian Bridge and make sure we improve them where we can. Uh, this location will actually be getting a uh, glass viewing portal uh, and also to keep the project, uh, which took longer than it should have, on track. In addition to opening the uh, 90th Street Pier, we worked with the Community Board 8 Manhattan Parks Committee co-chairs Peggy Price and Susan Evans on a campaign joined by every elected official. You can see them pictured here to open the Queensboro Oval to the public without having to pay $180 an hour at private tennis clubs. This summer, the Queensboro Oval was open to the public to play air-conditioned tennis using the city's annual tennis pass that cost not $100 an hour, but $100 for the entire season. The Upper East Side has more privately owned public spaces called POPs than almost anywhere else in the city. Developers received additional height for these public amenities, but they are often closed or in disrepair or do not exist at all. Working with Comptroller Stringer and Land Use Chair Greenfield, we passed Local Law 250 of 2017, mandating POPs to have signage detailing amenities, advising residents to call 311 with complaints, and establishing escalating and ongoing fines. Former Manhattan Chamber of Commerce President Nancy Plager has spent years fighting for improvements to POPs in the neighborhood, and this law was a part of her advocacy. Whether it's in our parks or uh, whether it's in our parks or our homes, we as New Yorkers are sometimes just looking for some peace and quiet. Next slide. In fact, New York City's number one three-in-one complaint is noise. A report from State Comptroller Thomas Napoli says it's only getting worse. New York City may be the city that never sleeps, but that shouldn't be a result of after hours construction noise waking you up before seven, after six, or on weekends. Richard McIntosh and Pamela Tucker lived across the avenue from one of the noisiest construction sites in the city. They came to First Fridays for months, and we did our best to help, but it was clear that the laws were broken. I authored Introduction 1653, which passed the council working closely with the Department of Environmental Protection to poise, put noise mitigation plans online, require rules for inspections when noise is actually happening or going to occur, move noise measurement from inside your apartment to the street, and to allow inspectors to actually stop the noisy construction. And best of all, it turns down after hours construction noise by about half in residential neighborhoods. New York City will be even better when they finish building it. But the 9,000 scaffolds spanning 200 miles of our city would indicate that most of our city is either in construction or disrepair. The problem is that scaffolding goes up and doesn't come down for months or years while no work is happening. Some scaffolding is almost old enough to vote. <laughs> I've introduced legislation working to continue so it's requiring work to continue without interruption for more than a week and to be completed within three to six months or the city would step in and do the work and make bad landlords pay. If you hate scaffolding as much as I do, we need your help to fight real estate interests and get citywide support. Mo Most quality of life problems really come down to a couple of bad neighbors who ignore fines or just pay them as a cost of doing business, whether it's sidewalks that go unshoveled or uncleaned, trash that piles up, noise or worse. And that's why I authored Local Law 47 of 2016 requiring the city to withhold or revoke 
licenses, permits, and registrations for scoff laws and repeat offenders. While the city has actually refused to enforce this law, we've held hearings calling agencies to task to make them actually improve the quality of life in our neighborhood. Even when neighbors and residents did the right thing, trash was piling up over the tops of trash cans or a gust of wind was blowing refuse all over our streets. Thanks to the persistence of Andrew Fine, who joins me each month at Brainstorm with Ben, as well as partnership with Susan Gottridge, both of whom are with the East 86th Street Neighborhood Association, as well as Valerie Mason at the East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association, we launched a pilot to see if new, large, covered trash cans could have an impact. Following positive results and support from the East 60s Neighborhood Association, led by Judy and Barry Schneider, we've invested a total of 175, 400, $175,490 on 322 new large covered trash cans for every corner in the district. <laughs> I owe a very special thanks to these leaders and their organizations. Four years, six days, 14 hours, and uh, 31 minutes and four seconds into my service, according to the voters, these trash cans are apparently the best thing I've ever done. <laughs> In some places, we're still getting complaints, like on 86th Street, whose train stations see as many visitors as Penn Station at more than 20 million a year. We continue our work towards establishing a business improvement district for East 86th Street to supplement city services with daily street sweeping and support for our local businesses. You can help clean up the East 86th Street by getting your favorite business and their landlord to share their support at bencalos.com slash bid slash support. <clears throat> We're also seeing more homeless and panhandlers throughout our city as of the new year. 22,636 children woke up in a shelter with 17,385 parents, 5,309 adults and families, 10,706 single men, 4,061 single women, and an estimated 3,892 people on our streets. To take on this issue in 2016, I launched the East Side Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services with Senator Liz Kruger and Borough President Gail Brewer, convening local churches, synagogues, and nonprofits with city agencies. We are devoted to building supportive housing in the district to help the homeless. We've been proud to break ground on East 91st Street for 17 two-bedroom supportive homes for women in need, led by former Speaker Christine Quinn, alongside Social Services Commissioner Steve Banks, Congress Member Carol Maloney, Borough President Gail Brewer, Senator Kruger, uh, Assembly Member Seawright, Community Board 8, Rector Jennifer Reddell of the Church of the Epiphany, and student leaders from PS 527, the Eastside School for Social Action, and Eastside Middle School. We've already been able to help chronically homeless individuals in the community who we believe have long been suffering from mental illness, often spitting. When a resident was willing to come forward and work with me, the 19th Precinct, the District Attorney, and Department of Social Services, we worked together to help get them the help that they need and help them off our streets. We hope to get every unsheltered person living in the in, on the street the help they need. If you see one of our city's most vulnerable on the street, please call 311 or use the 311 app. Ask them to dispatch a homeless outreach team. They'll ask where you saw the person, what they looked like, and offer to report back to you on whether the person accepts our city's offer of shelter, three meals a day, health care, rehabilitation, and job training. Please consider financially supporting our volunteers or volunteering with our ethos partners in the district uh, to help those who are less fortunate. Our homeless crisis is a symptom of our city's long-term affordable housing crisis, with tenants and rent-regulated housing being forced out onto the streets unable to find new affordable housing to meet their needs. As Vice Chair of the Progressive Caucus, I've been leading the charge to protect tenants from harassment, wrongful evictions, blacklists, and rent hikes. We introduced the Stand for Tenant Safety, a package of 12 bills to protect tenants from harassment. With two bills I authored signed into law, Local Law of 152 of 2017, counts violations that are not only hazardous but hurt quality of life for tenants and make them subject to tax, lien, tax liens that help identify bad landlords. Local Law 153 of 2017 identifies landlords of big buildings who have accrued massive debt and forces them to make necessary repairs or else see their property foreclosed on through a program called third-party transfer and hand it off to a responsible nonprofit owner. We also help
We also helped pass a right to counsel on housing court to help fight wrongful eviction and keep residents in their homes. With more tenants going to housing court, many will find themselves on the tenant blacklist used by landlords to reject potential tenants. Having worked with assembly members Jonathan Bing as his chief of staff on, on state legislation, I introduced local legislation to protect going to court as a human right and worked with Senator Liz Kruger on city legislation to regulate tenant screening companies. Each year, the Rent Guidelines Board votes on rents for over a million rent stabilized apartments and each year we lead the council in fighting for a rent rollback to account for the years of increases that outpaced inflation and actual landlord costs. In the last four years, we've won two consecutive rent freezes. We've done a lot for tenants in affordable housing, but what about residents who call my office every day for help finding affordable housing? Thanks to a hero and whistleblower at the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Stephen Werner, we learned through ProPublica that owners of 15,000 buildings receiving over $100 million from the city in tax breaks failed to register any affordable units, leaving New Yorkers roughly 50,000 units short of what they were promised. In response, I authored Introduction 1015, which forces developers and landlords who get hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks in return for building and keeping affordable housing units in their developments to actually live up to their end of the deal. Developers receiving these incentives from the city will have to register these units so we can see where they are and so that low-income New Yorkers can actually apply for new and for the first time existing affordable housing. After months of negotiation, this bill has been passed and is waiting to be signed into law. <clears throat> in the past, developers had been able to circumvent city zoning laws restricting building forms, use, height, and density through something called the Board of Standards and Appeals, or BSA, even though the local community boards and elected officials objected to the board's decisions. At my inauguration, I pledged to focus on this little known but powerful agency and authored laws to reform applications, decisions, notifications, staffing, and transparency around the BSA to be more accountable to the public. Even without going through the BSA, developers have found ways to create new locals in the law to make buildings taller than ever before without any public review. After years of watching Super Tall after Super Tall casting Central Park and our residential neighborhood into shadow, we drew the line on building buildings for billionaires at Sutton. We organized the first under the leadership of Dieter Selig of the Sutton Area Community, then through the East River 50s Alliance, a coalition of 45 buildings, 2,700 individuals from 550 buildings from around the city, led by Alan Kirsch, Robert Schepler, Jessica Osborne, and Lisa Mercurio. We are joined by co-applicants, Borough President Brewer, Senator Kruger, Council Member Gorodnik, with support from our Congress Member Carol Maloney. Local heroes like Herndon Worth and Charles Fernandez stood up for the community. <coughs> Though many thought it was impossible, we rezoned the East 50s before developers of the first Super Saul site could finish their foundation. We showed residents everywhere that they could lead grassroots rezoning to dictate what their neighborhood should look like with the support of elected officials who worked for them, not real estate. New buildings in the area will be squatter and more in line with the surrounding neighborhood thanks to new restriction forcing developers to use about half of their development rights under 150 feet, thus limiting zoning lot mergers and how tall buildings can get. The super tall developer hasn't given up and neither have we. Please support the effort at irfa.nyc. On the Upper East Side, developers are using and even creating loopholes to build taller than they should, with 16-foot floor-to-ceiling heights, huge empty spaces in buildings that aren't counted against the building height, tiny lots, even buildings on pedestals and stilts. Uh, the building you're looking at is, uh, a, I believe, a 30-story building that goes up to uh, more than 500 feet tall because of that pedestal in the middle, and I've allocated funding to Friends of the Upper East Side Historic District to study how to close these lip tolls for predictable development, and I'm asking you to consider supporting them as well at friends-ues.org. 
All of these fights mean overcoming the strong influence of big real estate money and politics, whether outside income or campaign cash. When I got elected as a council member, uh, council members could take payments for legal services from, fr council members could take payment for legal services from developers with business before the city or would get cash payments from the speaker, a practice the Daily News referred to as legal grease. I chose not to take outside income or payments from the speaker and authored laws to end these unsavory practices, making the city council a full-time job. <laughs> I also ended the practice of amplifying the voices of lobbyists who bundled large amounts of money, which will no longer be matched with public dollars. Even with all these victories, 95% of the money raised for mayoral candidates in 2013 came in big dollar contributions, with half of them being $4,950, the maximum amount allowed under the law and more than you can give the President of the United States. Much of this money comes from real estate. This is because the city only gives candidates a little more than half the money they need to reach their spending limit. I proposed matching every small dollar so anyone can run for office with contributions of $175 or less to get big money out of New York City politics. Please sign and share the petition at bencalis.com slash big money out. Okay, we've made it about 10% through the speech. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us today. We've accomplished so much in the past four years, and I ask you for your continued partnership in the years to come. If you found something interesting, anything really, it was a long speech, please join me in making it happen. It's been an honor to serve you as your council member over the past four years, six days, 14 hours, 42 minutes, and three seconds. Thank you.